Hello, I'm Evan Hughes, and we're in China to meet some of the artists at the forefront of the first great movement of the 21st century. Not since American pop art of the 1950s and 60s has a group of artists so decisively captured the global imagination. Chinese contemporary art is taking the world by storm, coinciding with the emergence of China itself after years of isolation. And with the eyes of the world on China, we're going to take a look at the country through the eyes of its artists, a remarkable group of individuals holding up a mirror to the vast social and economic changes upending their lives, plus a billion more. It's a time of change. And the time of change is so massive and it affects the whole of the society. And the artist, as elegant spokesman, gives it fall. This period of history has been as exciting as it would have been to have been in Paris in the early 1900s. Out of this kind of incredible period of just innovation and inspiration, there will be people emerge who will, you know, be remembered as Picasso, Matisse, and you know any other number of, uh, you know, Brach, the artists that you can name from that period of the early moderns. This is a movement that really emerged in the late 1970s, when Deng Xiaoping declared open door policy in China. What we saw were some of the very first kind of exhibitions in fits and starts of experimental contemporary Chinese art. And in many ways, this was the beginning point. Before the open door policy, artists had been constrained by the dictates of the Cultural Revolution. Basically, they produced big inspirational propaganda posters of the Mao era. Art truly was the servant of the state. You depicted things that were heroic and you presented positive characters. The most positive of all, of course, was Chairman Mao, you know, who was represented as the sun. And in the early 80s, a lot of the images of Mao that had hung everywhere started to be taken down. Just, just that intense pro uh, propaganda that was visually everywhere was quietly removed. Now, this is where uh, people here start to hear Simon and Garfunkel where people start to read some modern literature, where there's an awareness of, you know, of big films and even sort of theatre productions. So it's an incredibly lively period. By the end of the decade, in the 1980s, there was a very important exhibition called China Avant-Garde at the National Art Museum. And this was an exhibition where over a hundred artists came together to show their work. And this is often posited as a really important moment when Chinese contemporary art, in a way, was efficiently recognised. But all that would come to an abrupt end with the crackdown of the pro-democracy movement in Tiananmen Square. In this repressive environment of the early 1990s, artists were driven overseas or underground, and out of the upheaval came images that now define China's first great wave of contemporary art. Movements known as political pop and cynical realism. Fang Lijian started off creating these great sort of lumbering figures, these, these which were very quickly interpreted as being sort of like the, the image of a generation. It was that disaffected youth of his generation who had had so much goodwill, you know, everything they thought that they were heading towards in, in the late 80s seemed to have been pulled from under their feet. Well, the very early artists who depicted Mao in their paintings were actually very bold because Mao was being represented in a way that he'd never been represented. It was difficult for artists to show art publicly. We often used our diplomatic apartments uh, as temporary exhibition spaces. And uh, so um, we would 
hang their paintings uh, and then invite people and escort them into the apartments and spend a weekend using our apartments as an exhibition. Western diplomats like Jeff Raby have been there from the early days, encouraging young, emerging artists. In the 1980s, it was inconceivable that um, foreigners and Chinese could mix freely together, that uh, they could own apartments in the same apartment block, uh, that they could go to bars and clubs together, um, that the uh, cultural life could be so uh, open. Uh, things like that have just changed, uh, as I said, beyond all expectation. Exhibitions. I love that tank. It was New Year's Day 2000, the first day of the new millennium, that my father and I were first introduced to this new art. It was at the home of the former Swiss ambassador to China, Uli Sig, and it was an astounding experience of discovery. And there in his castle in Switzerland, over six floors, was a really diverse reading of the new art out of China. That first great collection of more than 1,200 artworks has since toured the world under the banner of Mahjong. It was this meeting with Uli Sig which opened the doors into contemporary art for us in China. One of the first studios I saw was that of Chi Chi Long's. Chi Chi Long is of the first of the new wave. He's been in the artist villages at the beginning. Chi Chi Long is a painter of a wonderful long series of revolutionary women. They're about beautiful girls. They're about a time of idealism. They're incredibly seductive images that harken back to this time with a kind of hint of nostalgia that many artists of this generation think of the Cultural Revolution, believe it or not, as a period with very fond memories when they were growing up and coming of age as artists. As part of the aftermath of, of, of Tiananmen, um, many artists decided that they wanted to leave China um, and they went all over the world. Some went to America, some went to Canada and some of course came to Australia. ASEAN is one of those artists who found a new freedom away from the politics of China, and Australia allowed him to reflect more deeply on his Chinese past. The cultural background can be deposited into your, your brain, and uh, it's always influential, no matter you, later on you, where you move to live. In Australia, ASEAN's artistic expression evolved, who began creating exquisitely painted porcelain busts. In many ways, they are a very, very eloquent expression, you know, of his own displacement and his own cultural conversation, you know, with himself as someone who is Chinese, who's found himself in a different cultural environment. Now Beijing beckons. Like so many other expatriates, ASEAN divides his time between his adopted country and China. They're reconnecting, you know, with the city that they grew up in, you know, with, with their place, you know, which has moved on so dramatically that still I think some of them feel like foreigners there. The openness now of the economy, uh, the capacity for Chinese to travel and foreigners to visit China, uh, is underpinning uh, this great uh, cultural uh, uh, flowering that we see present in the Chinese contemporary art scene.
This is the 798 Art District. When I first came here eight years ago, the place was practically deserted. It took a group of artists and intellectuals to save it, along with the German government trying to save the beautiful Bauhaus buildings. Those buildings, of course, have been transformed now, bringing a little bit of Europe or America to Beijing. We see private museums being built by artists and private collectors. And you see auction houses emerge. By this account, you know, Beijing is certainly on its way to becoming a major art center. Well, there's no question that things are much, much more open, much, much freer. And I think a measure of how free things are is, is really how few things are closed down. The way China has opened itself to the world. The world has poured its product in with, with, with great glee. And there are those keen observers, such as the Lau brothers. And it's three brothers who work together. <laughs> they brainstorm. They're like very clever three stooges. Chop. The Lao brothers embody what became known as Gordy Art, a movement that developed in the late 1990s. And while they delight in sending up consumer culture, they have become its beneficiaries. Major works by these artists will sell for up to half a million dollars. <laughs> like the Lao brothers, Chang Zugong is an artist confronted by the huge changes China has undergone and the impact of newfound wealth on its people. He uses a sewing machine to make his portraits of China's new mega rich. It's kitsch, but it's loaded with attitude and acute observation. Jin treasures his connections with the past. Even his studio tells you that this is a true aesthete who could never lose himself in artistic fads or fashions. His work is marked by affection and humor. It's a great celebration of humans at play.首先一个是我的大部分作品都有我自己出现这个呢就是我因为我画画有一个原则我希望就是我画的是我了解的东西那么我了解的东西呢我自己我好像就是说至少说我有比如说我有自恋倾向我有自恋倾向的话呢我对我自己首先还是从心理上是肯定的所以说
Yang Jing Song is one of the leaders of the next generation, the so-called second wave. He's not following the notion that it has to look Chinese, it has to follow Mao. His art tells a more personal story. This is part of my life, the artist, and I love art. And because I can't do anything without painting. Tell all the stories of our society, or our surrounding, our environment, all the problems we have. What are some of those stories? Yeah, this story you, you, may, you may see from the fish series, they're, they're all about violence, cruelty. I'm not looking for the beauty, I think. Maybe you can look for some, something beautiful uh, in my old series, but not the recent one. Behind me is one of Yan Jin Song's earlier works. This is uh, a work filled with some of the paraphernalia of uh, life in modern China in the late 90s. Things start to seep in, such as DVD players, televisions, electric rice cookers. And of course, at the centre of it is a serenity of Yan Jin Song, the artist, and his wife. And sadly, a serenity which, as we'll see, will disappear in later works. Why did you disappear from the paintings? Maybe I should change because of the, my environment change so fast. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't follow our time. I only can feel something important in our, in our time. So that's the reason why, I, why I'm changed. These days, when you walk around the streets of the Sichuan city of Chongqing, you are left wondering where does architecture end and art begin? This one's terrific. This one's fantastic with the, the birds and the, uh, the suit, the Amani suit. It's fantastic. Here we meet Chen Wei Min, whose paintings of Chongqing capture the colors of his surroundings in an expressive manner reminiscent of the 19th century fauves. The essence of great art is to capture when and where mm. the artist is living. Mm. Uh, we walk from the street into a romantic version of this street. And mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. We're going to meet one of the artists who's moved from the northern provinces and now lives and works in Chongqing, Li Zhang Yang. He's an artist I first saw in Basel and represents one of the artists whose career has really taken off. Ni hao. Ni hao. Hello, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Li Zhang Yang has long pushed the boundaries in his art with biting, irreverent observations of Chinese society. In his world, debauchery and corruption loom large, and sex ah, is finished. never far away. You don't see images of sex that much in Chinese contemporary art. Mm. Can you display this work in China? Can you show this in Beijing? I, I think uh, it's very difficult because the uh, Chinese uh, government uh, uh, forbidden uh, like this, yes. uh, sexy, political. There are some subjects that are out of bounds and I have certainly seen that in operation today in exhibitions and art fairs and things like that that, that go on in China today. Some subjects as, such as uh, sex, violence and religion are still to some degree taboo in state-run museums. Back in Beijing, in one of those huge purpose-built studios, one of the more unusual commissions is nearing completion. The client is the Nielsen family, whose privately funded Museum of Contemporary Chinese Art is soon to open in Sydney. The White Rabbit Museum will be dedicated to Chinese art made since the year 2000. And judging by Wang Ziyuan's work, it will be an arresting experience for the public. Wang Zhuyan, he's 
often known as the underpants guy in Beijing. He does wonderful sculptures which are large scale reproductions, usually of candy pink women's underpants. His latest pair of panties are about four metres squared, so they're huge. Neon lights and, and twinkling lights and it's all just really in your face. And I remember Wang saying his comment, comment about this work was that all over the world, um, you know, red light districts are marked by these flashing lights and garish colours, whereas you go to Beijing and that's just, that's Beijing everywhere. But there is nothing flippant about the work of Louis Jardong. The cynical realist painter was amongst the first on the scene in the 1980s and is revered both locally and internationally as one of the finest artists in China today. He paints in something of a socialist realist technique and often figures that are non-heroic. And in that way, I think he's reacting against the kind of art that he would have seen during the Cultural Revolution when he was a youth. And like the French artists he so admires, in particular Cezanne, Louis Jardong's preferred studio is outdoors. This is real people affected by real things in real time. I like to paint in meat, body. I think it's a very, very exciting for, for me. Some like when I'm hungry, I want to eat. I'm painting just like that. I want to eat color. <laughs> I find drama from life, day life. I don't read many books, but I read life. Earlier this year, one of his paintings from the Three Gorges series set a world record for a Chinese contemporary artist when it sold for $9.3 million. And it marks the uh, flooding of the Three Gorges for the Yangtze Dam. And it was a time, and it's still continuing, when many millions of people were relocated. And this kind of social dislocation that occurred has really not been addressed within China. You were a teacher at the Central Academy. What are some of the most important things you teach your young students? I teach my students, open your eyes, open your mind, uh, because the, the art uh, is very difficult. I told my students, take time. You know, take time, it's a need, need time. Yeah. In just 30 years, Chinese art has been utterly transformed from a mere propaganda arm of the Politburo to a genuine cultural revolution that seems to know no boundaries. Who would have ever thought that China would become home to the artist as superstar? We have artists like Liu Xiaodong responding to that. He mounted an exhibition in Beijing at a gallery. And of course, knowing that if he were to have produced paintings on canvas, they would have been snapped up well before the opening reception. So instead, he chose to paint directly onto the wall. People wanted to cut out the Jiprock on the wall and be able to say that that was their Lu Xiaodong painting, but he refused. I mean, it is a remarkable phenomenon when you think that uh, within our lifetime, you know, a single artist, you know, their life has changed so dramatically, you know, in every way. For some of the artists of China, this phenomenon will be the means of great wealth and temporary fame on the back oh. of international hype. 
for others, celebrity is but a byproduct of serious artistic practice. It is their work that will ensure that the Chinese contemporary movement will not be a chapter in art history that is easily forgotten.